Hello, welcome to News Click. Recently, there has been a lot of discussion and debate around the so-called freebie culture. Uh, Delhi BJP leader Ashwini Upadhyay has filed a PIL with the Supreme Court, stating that political parties are giving a lot of promises uh, in the name of freebies during elections, and those are uh, having a huge burden on the state exchequers. To discuss on this matter, we have with us Professor Venkatesh Atreya. Hello, sir. Thanks a lot for joining us. So, what is a freebie and what is this so-called freebie culture? Uh, and do you think the word is loaded and is it misleading? Yeah, I'm glad you used the word so-called. I want to start this discussion by putting down a few basic propositions. First, in the societies that we live in, in, in all human societies, basically, you know, you have nature's resources, right? On top of it, you apply human labor. Sometimes, you know, early stages without instruments, later you become sophisticated, you develop tools. That's man is a tool-making animal, as Benjamin Franklin once said. Then you have advanced science and technology, more equipments. But at the end of the day, all production is due basically to two factors, nature and labor. So in a society where the wealth of society every year is being produced by the working people, uh, who also end up paying taxes for all the things they buy, GST and all that, you, one is never asking the question, what is the contribution these working people are making to society's production? What are they getting back? My simple argument is that the working people, as opposed to what the PM and the FM have been saying, it is the working people who produce the wealth of the nation through their labor, using available science and technology instruments and all of that, fine. And this includes people right up to the top management level who are involved in work in some fashion, you know. Now, they get a portion of it back as wages or salaries or self-employed incomes like farmers or artisans. A large part of it is surplus. And this goes to those who own the factories and the farms and the big means of production. Now, what are we doing in this society? We tax the guys who produce the wealth, that is the ordinary people, working people, and we subsidize offer tax concessions constantly to those who live off the surplus of the rest of the population. We also claim to be, you know, taking society to newer heights and more growth and all that. So this whole irony is that the question of freebies should be direct, directed at the corporate sector, not at the working people. So the complete inversion of the whole dynamic that we are seeing. So that's the first point I want to make. Secondly, um, you know, when you, let's say, for example, provide laptops for plus two students or bicycles for girls students to go to school. What are you doing? Is there a freebie? Is it a waste? Is it a revenue expenditure? It may get classified as revenue expenditure in the budgetary documents, but it is an investment in human beings, right? In the very inverted way that capitalism looks at everything, all human creations are looked at as manifestations of the machine. So we become human capital. This is an absurd term. We create the means of production, we create the new science, the new technology, and we get called one more form of capital. I mean, this complete inversion again is something you have to constantly be alert to. You know, in every facet of life, what Marx would have called contradiction, every facet of life you find this constant, you know, inversion of the active element in production, which is labor. Working people produce wealth, including, you know, intellectuals and manual workers, mental workers, all of that, you know, all working people no matter what the qualifications and skills are, they're producing every year some output. A part of it goes back to them as wages, salaries, maybe sometimes even share options possibly, but they, on top of that, in, take India for example, if you take the tax revenues of the union government plus all the state governments, 65 to 67% of that, two-thirds roughly of that, comes from what are called indirect taxes. That is taxes which are paid on goods purchased, services purchased. These fall at the same rate on the richest and the poorest person. When I buy an item, I pay the same rate of tax as a Nambani does or as a poor man on the street does. So it's fundamentally iniquitous. It's fundamentally a very regressive kind of tax. This whole indirect tax, taxes on commodities. Now you hiked it so much, especially in the last eight years in this regime, the constant raising of the excess duties on petrol and petrol products and so on. And in other, way, other ways also through a very uh, 
badly designed and crudely implemented GST, which is getting worse by the day. You have uh, imposed a huge fine on working people who produce the wealth, don't get it, get, get only a share of it, and then they pay taxes on what is in their hands. Right. Now, you turn to them and say, aha, education, subsidy, that's a, that's a freebie. Or transport, women traveling in city buses get to travel without paying tickets. That's a freebie. This is, this is the problem, you know. Supreme Court judges shouldn't be talking about these things. It's not the domain of competence at all. But these days, you know, if you are a judge, you can speak on anything under the sun. If, likewise, if you're a political figure and so on. But strictly speaking, you could look at every one of these as investments in raising the capability of human beings in the population. Okay. Now, take something which, is, which seems a bit more complicated. Television. Why, would, why did the DMK give television free television in 2006. Well, you know, it was part of the election promise, but that apart, and there are, of course, some of the, the DMK big wigs are running a uh, television studio, they had interest in the television sector. All that is there, but I was educated in this regard by people. I went to a couple of villages studying this phenomenon. They said, sir, for the first time we are watching news in our lives. These are people from the villages who had never been having access to visual news, Radio news they may hear occasionally, but visual news makes such a huge impact on them. Good or bad you can discuss, but for the first time they had access to the visual medium and they could watch the news on that. Now, to the typical urban middle class area, why are we wasting money on televisions for the rural masses? This is a way of, you know, diverting them. Very easy to talk, but for them, for those households, it made a difference. First of all, it meant that the children didn't go and sit in somebody else's house. Young girls, 17, 18, did not go to somebody else's house to watch television. They were in their own houses. They could watch TV. The fact that the TV didn't last forever is a different thing. And they would have had to buy the next round of uh, you know, television sets. Just like Mr. Modi promises you uh, a gas stove but doesn't give you any gas cylinder. Or hikes it to 1,000 rupees a cylinder. So, you know, rulers can do all sorts of tricks. At the end of the day, one must think twice before dismissing something as, you know, uneconomic or irrelevant or unnecessary. What constitutes necessity? What constitutes an appropriate expenditure? Take, for example, the other side of so-called freebies which go to the poor. Uh, 2019, I've done this interview for New York much earlier also on this. In 2019, when the economy was in doldrums and the businessmen were saying, we can't sell cars, two-wheelers, we can't sell biscuits, Nirmala Sitaraman offered them a massive tax concession uh, from 30% to 22%. And she herself said in that uh, statement that this would cost the exchequer 1.45 lakh crore rupees in a year. Nobody called it a freebie. It was supposed to be an incentive, right, to get the economy out of doldrum. No, what was the narrative there? Was there any guarantee that this would lead to investment and growth? Has it led? No. So there is a whole narrative being spun, being constructed to say that Whenever you provide tax concessions to the corporate sector, that is good for the economy, good for growth, and ultimately it will come back to people as more output, more jobs, more incomes. Simply not validated throughout the world. International experience of the neoliberal capitalism for the last 30 years tells you that all such concessions end up swelling the pockets of the big companies, but do very little for the ordinary people. So, wealth inequalities, income inequalities are increasing. Take this regime of eight years. They cancelled the wealth tax. They abolished it. That's what Arun Jaitley did in 2017. His last parting gift to the to the country. Then uh, he had actually said that companies with an annual turnover exceeding some amount uh, alone had to pay uh, you know 30 percent. So others would pay less and so on. Then Mr. Raman said everybody is entitled to a lower tax rate now. This is before the concession itself. The 2019 concession comes a little later. But so there's been one round after another of concessions to the corporate sector and also to high net worth individuals in personal income tax, exemptions of various kinds. And apart from taxation, you also know that this government in recent years has actually uh, allowed the corporates not to have to pay back the loans. They've written off loans with about, about 10 point. 2-5 lakh crores is what I am told. The numbers keep varying. But certainly a very significant sum of money owed by large corporate entities to 
banks, both private sector banks, but also much more publicly owned banks, has been written off. Now, is that a freebie or is that an incentive? Is that something to put the economy on track? So, why do we think that uh, if GDP growth rate is reported, but people are starving, it's fine? I mean, this is the whole understanding. It's not just about moral questions, who deserves it and so on, but simple fact that working people produce the wealth and pay taxes on it, whereas the image of the taxpayer as a sported and suited person is so deeply you know, entrenched in the minds of people because of the uh, <laughs> television as a medium. You watch any channel and you know this very neatly dressed fellow is the high guy who's complaining about taxes, but they pay very little taxes compared to the share of the incomes that accrue to them in the country and the wealth, share of the wealth that they own now. They, pay, they don't pay wealth tax. There is no estate duty. There's no uh, inheritance tax. Extraordinary country, which is so little taxation on the well to do and so much on the poor. So that's my take. So then if you go into the question of freebies and the whole discourse is just wrong. And I saw that piece, that statement by Shima Goyal two days ago in the Hindu saying, oh, freebies have a cost. Well, don't co tax concessions to the corporate sector have a cost. Have you done a single white paper all your life in the academic world or in the government on what has been the claimed benefits of tax concessions for the economy, what have been the actual benefits, what have been the actual costs of those concessions. No, no state government, no union government has given a white paper on claims about costs and benefits of tax concessions or you have these global investors conferences, big gala events and so a lot of media space. Uh, and of course, ads and all that. So, but at the end of the day, first of all, how much of the promised investment comes in? Secondly, even if it does come in, how much employment does it create? How much output increase does it contribute to? And what of that comes as income to the domestic population, which has had to bear free power for these guys, free land given to them? Take Tamil Nadu. You know, invited MNCs over the years, and because now there's all this talk about the Dravidian model and so on. Well, the, when the Dravidian parties have been in power, they've been very kind to the corporate sector. Maybe that's being part of the Dravidian model, that's for them to say. But you have huge concessions given to Nokia or to other people who just pack up and go. And they are not obliged to worry about employment of the workers. Ford packs up and goes. Any, any questions asked? Foxconn? Yeah, I can add the list, you see. So, so when you are inviting global capital or Indian big capital, what do you promise them? You promise them the freedom that they can move out anytime they want. They can take the currency anywhere in the world. They don't have to pay. Uh, if they don't pay taxes, we won't ask too many questions. You know, and you can, okay, if you can pay electricity bills, we'll be happy. But if you don't, all right, we'll assure you power. We'll assure you water. We'll assure you land. And we'll assure you a docile workforce. We'll have a labor law uh, reform, which makes uh, the working day 12 hours. So what have you, that is a freebie to the corporate sector, making workers work for 12 hours, forcing down wages. These are all freebies to the corporate sector. Why doesn't the media talk about these freebies? Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for joining us and uh, giving us such detailed uh, inputs on this discussion. Thank you. Thanks.